Stem Cells 102, Beyond Embryonic Stem Cell Research. Stem cell research is back in the news with this week's executive order from President Obama that lifts restrictions on federally financed human embryonic stem cell research. Today we'll learn about the implications of that initiative and learn more about a process for creating stem cell lines called partenogenesis. It is my pleasure to introduce today's host, Ken Aldrich, Chairman, CEO, and Co-Founder of International Stem Cell Corporation. Kenneth? Thank you very much, Janet. We'll skip rather quickly through the first two slides. The first simply identifies us as International Stem Cell, and the second is the usual forward-looking statements disclaimer that I'm sure everyone listening to this has seen many, many times. The real key is in the third slide, which is labeled, Why Care About Stem Cells? And the answer is that stem cells are the key to treating a number of very nasty diseases. And we know that you can use cells human cells to treat diseases. The problem has been that we don't have a source of getting those cells, and when we use them from cadavers or other donor sources, uh, there's a major immune rejection problem. For example, uh, macular degeneration can be treated with human cells. The problem is that the major study on it used fetal cells. We're trying to replace those with cells derived from what we call parthenogenic stem cells. Similarly, the treatments for diabetes have been around for at least 10 years, a process called the Edmonton Protocol, which transplants islet cells, which come from the pancreas, and results in patients being insulin-free for sustained periods of time. Again, the problems have historically been a lack of cells and an immune response from the, from the donor. So there are lots of diseases that can be treated from, with cells if we get the cells and if we can solve immune rejection. If we go to the next slide, which is really one of the questions, which is what does Obama's removal of restrictions mean? What does it mean? It does a couple of things. One, it opens up research funding uh, for everybody, including us who otherwise would like to work in what are called pluripotent stem cells, and I'll explain what those are in a minute. There's about 10 billion of new funds overall, and a significant portion of that will go directly to stem cell research of one sort or another. There's still some congressional approval that has to be made, and the removal of the federal ban doesn't necessarily silence the ethical debate that surrounds embryonic stem cells, and I'll discuss that a little bit more in a moment also. The second question that comes up uh, all the time is what's the significance of the new announcement by Giron Corporation that they are going to use stem cells in human research? Frankly, this is a very big deal for us because it's the first clear evidence that the FDA is actually going to allow stem cells or cells derived from stem cells, to be more accurate, to be used in human trials. We've all thought that was going to be the case, but it's awfully nice to know that the FDA has stepped up and said, yes, you can do that. Obviously, the next benefit to us is that it provides a roadmap for all of us uh, who are following Giron down that path, and for some of us who hope to actually overtake them along the way. But it's very nice to have somebody blazing the initial trail with the FDA. The next slide is really the most important, and it's central to everything we talk about, and that is the technology itself. There are basically three kinds of what are called pluripotent stem cells. A pluripotent stem cell simply means that it's one of those cells that can become any cell in the human body, unlike what are called adult stem cells, which uh, have already started to become a liver cell or, or a neuron or some other body part and can't go backward around the trail to become something else. Pluripotent stem cells can actually be, the process is called differentiation, so they can be differentiated into any cell in the body if you learn how to do that. Sometimes learning how is easy and sometimes it takes a lot of work. So there are three kinds of pluripotent stem cells. The first are human embryonic stem cells, which have been around in the news and in fact for 10 years or more. They have two problems associated with them. One is the ethical issue. They use fertilized embryos which are destroyed in the process, and this is what has fueled all of the ethical debate and what until recently um, un underlay the prohibition against using federal funding with embryonic stem cells. The second problem related to them is that as far as we know, they will be treated by the body as any other uh, foreign tissue from a third party and will be subject to immune rejection, which is a major problem in many kinds of therapy. 
and one of the major reasons that human cells were not a, be a, were not able to be used, pardon me, in treating diabetes was that the body rejected them. Now, I will be, I have to be candid here and say that I believe that Geron believes that their cells, which are embryonic, that they're using in their human trials, can be used and that the body will gradually get used to them along with the use of some immunosuppressant drugs for a time-limited period. Frankly, we're not quite so sure and we're concerned that that may not be the case. The second class has also gotten a lot of publicity lately, and those are called induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells. Those are the ones you've heard about, which come from skin or other body tissues, and are basically reprogrammed back to a primal state so that they become pluripotent stem cells instead of behaving like adult stem cells that have limited applicability. There are two problems associated with those. One is that the process of reprogramming today at least, uses some known cancer-causing agents. There's a major effort by Harvard University and others to find a way to use chemical drugs instead of biologic agents to solve that problem, but it hasn't been solved yet. The second is that uh, uh, they still involve genetic manipulation, so there is always that possibility. However, IPS cells have enormous potential in drug discovery and in research because imagine that you have a patient who is diabetic or who has Alzheimer's or any other potentially genetically linked disease. If you can take their cells, take them back to the primordial state, and then bring them forward, you may be able to spot the point in time or the genetic change that causes the disease. No one knows, but there's a lot of interest in that and with good reason. You also will hear a lot of talk about using these cells for personalized medicine. The idea being that you take a patient's own cells, take them back to the primal state, and then grow the particular kind of cell that needs to be replaced, whether it's a liver cell or an islet cell or, or a retinal cell. This may work. If it does, it's going to be a long process because it takes a long time to reverse engineer the cells and then for them to be brought back to formal state. And in some cases where the disease is an autoimmune disease, there are going to be serious questions as to whether or not the body will not simply uh, recognize those as its own cells and attack them anyway. Nevertheless, it's, it's a major new area of research and is attracting a lot of attention and should be taken very seriously. The final method is our parthenogenic stem cell method, which in all candor we believe is going to be the most effective for getting therapeutic treatments to lots of people. There's no ethical issue because we use, we use unfertilized human eggs and never use a fertilized embryo so that we don't destroy those or damage them in any way. That takes the ethical issue pretty much off the table for almost everyone. The more important part as far as we're concerned is that because of the unique technique, we're able to match the immune systems of hundreds of millions of people with a single cell line. And that has enormous potential significance, as I'll get into as we move on to other slides. The next uh, slide that you'll see really just highlights the two peer-reviewed papers that we published on parthenogenic stem cells. And uh, those can be seen uh, by going to our website and uh, downloaded if you're technically minded. The next slide in is really an answer to the question, what is parthenogenesis? We simply take an unfertilized egg, we cause it to change into a small, or to create, I should say, the small cluster of cells from which we can derive a true stem cell line. It functions like an embryonic stem cell, uh, but has the additional advantage, as I mentioned before, of enabling us to deal with immune, react immune rejection. What's the technology? Well, there are two kinds of parthenotes. One is what we call heterozygous. They're the equivalent of embryonic stem cells without the ethical issues. The second is homozygous, also equivalent in function, but they have the additional benefit of avoiding immune rejection for very large groups of the population. As, a, as noted there on the slide, neither one of these uses or destroys fertilized embryos. That's our technology platform. Uh, we own it. We're licensing it and making it freely available to other researchers because we want to see things happen in this field and we want to see treatments get to patients.